Bob Spitz here with Management Success, and uh, on this edition or this uh, episode of our podcast on how to improve your bottom line through increasing your efficiency in your collision shop, I've got once again Kareem Abuzaid from uh, Knockout Collision, and I also have uh, Dino DiGiulio from Body Best up in Sonoma, and I'm going to sit back and let these two guys uh, hash it out on the processes that they've got employed in their shop once the vehicle has walked through the assembly line up to the point that the car, as far as technicians are concerned, is done. So we're going to take it from there through the QC process, the detail process, and the delivery of the car to the customer, and what are some of their, their practices that have helped them increase their efficiency. So Kareem, why don't you uh, start this thing off? So uh, l let's take it from that point. Okay, sure. So once the technicians are done with the car, it's been completely reassembled. Um, they have checked off all of the items that they need to. Um, you know, the, the technician actually, the body technician that reassembles the vehicle actually checks off that the paint match was done correctly, that everything looks good before he's put it together. Um, and then after he's done, he checks off that he's completed everything on the repair order, um, and then he turns that paperwork uh, into the production manager who assigns it to the detailer. And then the detailer goes through his checklist prior to starting the detail. And if there's anything that needs to be done um, or anything that's questionable, then he goes over that with the production manager for him to reassign labor if there's a problem. He'll give uh, instructions to the technician if there's anything that needs to be adjusted, fixed, anything that was missed, anything that doesn't meet the quality level that we want. Um, and then he'll actually send a rework order to the technician through his inbox to fix whatever needs to be done before it gets detailed. And you know, we learned that the hard way, I think, as most shops do. If you don't do your quality control inspection until after it's detailed, you just wasted a couple hours of detail. Because <laughs> pretty much anything the technician has to do at that point uh, is, is going to create a bit of a mess, fingerprints or otherwise, if there's any buffing that needs to be done. You know, compound gets spread all over the place again. And so that those things get sent back through, and then uh, the, de then the detail can, can actually proceed. And then a final quality control check gets done by the production manager and then by the estimator who's going to be handling the customer and delivering the car. So, Dino, do you follow a, a similar path there at the end of the repair? Pretty close, pretty close. We, um, so the technician finishes the repair and it goes to um, our parts manager and he does a, a final inspection <clears throat> to make sure before it hits detail that everything's functioning, doors are opening, closing, the gaps look good, there's a whole sheet of stuff he, he goes through, and then once he's finished with it, it is brought then to the detail department, and then that way if there's any problems, it's a, he goes right back to the technician and says, hey, this needs to be fixed, then he signs off on it. If there's anything that has to be polished, it'll then take a side step back to polish, and there's, there'll be little... Uh, posting notes on or a little arrow saying repolish, repolish, that'll get polished and then it'll go from polish back to detail. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't happen that often because the technician checks the color, checks to make sure it's polished before he starts reassembly. Um, and that usually it does definitely helps because they have their own checklist they have to do. Um, then the detail department gets it, they finish their detail, they put it out on the finish line. Um, they do also look at the color and double check to make sure it is looking good um, and then it's brought inside and the manager then goes back out and then re-inspects it and, and at this point really what he's looking at is the overall job. How does the overall job look like? He's not nitpicking little things like fit and finish because that's already been done, should mm -hmm. be already done. So at this point he uh, checks, makes sure everything's operating. Um, fit and finish looks good, and the overall job is what he's expected to give back to the customer. And then at that point, um, comes back in to the office, calls the customer, and the car is ready for delivery. And when we call the customer, this is what we've been trying to do 
is schedule the time for pickup. So we don't have five or six customers in the office at 4.30. And this right. has been pretty successful. So we try and break up our deliveries about a half an hour. So when the customer comes in to pick up, we can spend that time with them um, to go over the repair process, go over what we fixed on their car, any concerns they might have after the car has been you know, repaired, like what do, what do I do for care and maintenance of the new paint, all these questions that might arise, you have time to spend with the customer. And um, that scheduling process does work because then, 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 then you know that, hey, this car has to be finished by 3.30, this car has to be done by 4.30, and then you have a little bit better of a window of opportunity for the detail department to schedule their stuff and they're not running around pushing all these cars out that aren't going to go till you know, 4 or 5 or whatever. Right. And that's it. Okay. So that's great point. On our production board, we post what time the cars are going out to so that Detailers can manage their time a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's any funds that need to be collected at the end of the job, how does that play into this? That's all on the final packet. When we build the final folder, we write on the front of the, the folder what is owed, um, and then we verify that um, as the job's going through process, who's, that's the first thing we do is to find out where the funds are going to. Is it going to the customer coming to us? Um, if it's a, one, of our, one of our accounts, we know where the money's coming from. That's, that's, that's given by the color of the folder. Um, and then when the final bill is printed out and done, there's notes on the front of the folder and also on the paper they sign what is owed. Okay, good. Good. And uh, Kareem, do you do something similar on final payments? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we 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 have a policy that the uh, the vehicle doesn't get um, released until we have verified the final supplement is approved. Where that check is being mailed, uh, we verify the address, the amount, who it was, who it's addressed to. Um, we get a direction of payment in the in the beginning. Uh, as an authorization, and then so we can use that if necessary, if the payment comes in two-party check, uh -huh. and then it, if there's a holdup or a question about it, sometimes we will just let the customer know if they're in a hurry to pick up their car. If they want to cover the difference and just pay it, and wait for the insurance company to reimburse them directly, that's sometimes an option. Okay, good. So now. This is for either one of you can answer this one. How does, who is the person that's doing the, the delivery back to the customer? How do you organize that in your shop to make sure that the person who delivers it back to the customer really has the viewpoint of the consumer about what they were anticipating with their repair? Well, at Body Best, we we have the estimator that actually handled the customer in the beginning and there's been communication along the way through the repair not all the time our, our office manager sometimes makes some uh, phone calls to those customers but the initial contact is usually the, the most comfortable for the customer because they have a relationship with that person um, if if they get overloaded and I'm, I'm called to the front I will go up there and help but I know I know most of the jobs, so if, if I'm not familiar with the car, I'll grab the sheet and I'll go out there with them, and I can read the estimate really quickly and know what we fixed, and you know, walk them through anything, they, any concerns they might have. Um, but usually, it's the estimator that uh, wrote the original estimate that that sold the job. Good, because that's I want to tell you from a consumer point of view, that I think is extremely important. That it's not, here's your keys, thanks for coming in, you know, bye-bye. <laughs> you just had my car for a week. No, because when we take them out to the, the car, Bob, one of the, one of the um, things that we do is we explain to them that we detail their car and we didn't get paid for it. It's just, the, it's just the, one of our business practices that we do um, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure we give the car back to them better than when they brought it to us. And um, it's a PR action, you know. Absolutely. You, you you have to get that point across because they just think that oh you got paid to do that. No, we we actually didn't. 
we got paid to polish the car but not actually clean up the mess plus all the stuff that your kids left in the back seat from the, the lunch on the way down here. So um, it's important that they know that. And most of them, when they get their car back, they're so elated. They, they can see that the car has been fully detailed, and they're just like, oh, my God. And, th and that in itself is um, sometimes really gets that customer to refer you multiple times just because we've give, we, every time we work on it, we clean the car. Even if the repair was only $50, we still do a, a, a wash and a vacuum and clean the windows. Absolutely. I, I, three, do, you, do you agree with that? I, you know, I've been doing this, um, you know, doing a complimentary detail, and, and we spend quite a bit of time doing it, um, and I consider it a public relations action, mm -hmm. and w we do, we do do that and then resell the job, um, and I found it benefits in a lot of ways. Um, if you show the customer their car, show them, you know, that you've done this repair, show them how everything looks. You tell them, check it out, it's all completed, this is what we did, give them a general overview of the repairs you did, uh, let them know that you cleaned everything up for them too as a complimentary service, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then I remind them that we would guarantee everything that we've done as long as they have the car. That, that takes the worry out for them. Yeah, they finding see, something later. Yeah, they see the vehicle, they, they're comfortable with the way it looks, they're happy that it was cleaned up. I remind them that we guarantee everything we do. So I tell them, hey, we checked everything out, but if there's anything that you notice that doesn't seem right, please let us know because you know your car better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that really reassures them that we're solid, we're going to be here for them. You know, we did do a good job, but should ever anything come up, you know, we want to know about it. It's really confronting them and the situation, and it puts them at ease. Right. They're also much, it's, it's much easier, you, you delivered the product to them at that point, and then it's much easier for them to pay you and to get the money. They don't have any doubt about whether we held up our end of the deal. Sure. So then we go inside and collect, collect the money. Then we ask for referrals. Um, you know, after we've given them what we promised and then some, mm -hmm. then we ask them to help us by giving us some, some referrals or leave a review online. And it seems to be a really good system. Dino, are you, and I agree, Kareem, Dino, are you uh, having your estimators uh, prospect at the close for uh, referrals? Or is that? We actually, we actually put a card. That's one of the, the, the packet we put together for the customer. It has our warranty. It has the work that we performed, the final bill, they call it. Mm -hmm. It has a couple flyers in there. One of them is our Wheels to Prosper that we're always promoting. One of them is, you know, um, enter to win a detail if you just post a Google re, um, um, review and ah. that seems to be getting at least one or two reviews a month. It's, it's, it's not easy to do, to do a Google review through Google. They don't make it easy. If you don't have an account, you can't post a review. No, nope, so you got to have an account. Yelp. Yeah. Yeah, so th it's very important that I get a Google review because that does help our analytics, which helps, which is my website ranking. Um, and then on the bottom are cards. One of them is we promote, we want the customer to come back in six months, they get a free car wash. And they just got to call us um, sometime that day if they want to come out that day or the day before. We don't need that much notice for those car washes. And that way we get a chance to look at our work, if there's anything we need to refix or polish. Um, or that time, sometimes the customers say, hey, by the way, I, I noticed this. And that's when they tell you, can you fix or adjust this? And we can handle any of those concerns at that point. So we don't lose our customers over something really small. Um, and then uh, next to the free car wash card is a care enough to share card with their name on it to save that person $45 or they can use the card if they get in an accident in the next whatever year and they still have that card, they can bring that in and use it themselves if they have not given it to a friend or family member. Excellent. Excellent. And. Um we do the same process too. We're, we'll take the customer out to the car, walk them around it, show them what we did, t explain to them the detail process, how we detailed it. We didn't get reimbursed for that. Um, that's just part of business. Um, and then at that point, you know, make sure they, if they have any friends or family members that need any repairs done, we do 
we do like our referrals and then bring them back into the office and then accept, get their money and get them to sign all the paperwork. And, right. And now, we, give them a free, we also give them a free T-shirt. Let, let me ask you guys both a question because you're both owners. You're both high-tone guys. You both care a lot about your business. You care a lot about your customers. How do you, because I know it, you were both able to just rattle off these very good processes and uh, procedures that you employ in your shop. How do you instill into your people that same level of care so that it isn't this glib kind of, oh yeah, and, and this and that, and I, as a consumer, I can feel that this person is just going through the motions. He really doesn't care about me or my car. He's just busy. He's got to get to the next car that he's got to deliver because I totally know that you can never be too busy to give a consumer your undivided attention. You know, do what you're doing while you're doing it. How do you instill that into your people? So that the processes that you both just named and you just rattled them right off get translated down, that your intention and your care gets pushed down that line so that no matter who delivers that car, it's that same concept. I'd say it's a combination of a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One, the most important thing, um, is having employees that do care and that are high-toned enough that they care about other people and aren't willing uh, you know, to do things um, that they wouldn't feel comfortable doing, you know. Mm -hmm. I try to really teach teach our employees to treat customers' vehicles the way they would want their own treated. Um, and then, you know, it needs to become, they need to know the process like I do. So, so it has to be written and it has to be drilled. You know, it has to be done over and over again the same way, so so they don't have to think about it. So it's natural. So I think it's a combination of those two things: having the right people that really do care, first of all, and then having them really know the processes and policies the way they need to, so they don't have to think about it. Right. That sounds exactly right. Do you know you agree with that? Totally. The um the front office has taken me a while to get where I want it, and I call I call them the dream team right now. Um, <laughs> it's just taken a lot of training. I, I I'm going to emphasize training because the more they understand why I want to deliver the car the way I want to deliver it, the more they're going to want to do it. You know, and they are. If they're high tone, they're going to get it really fast, and they're going to understand that this is, and if we can do this delivery process right. We will see them back, and they will be elated to. They'll want to refer us, and they'll want to send their friends, and that just helps their, their, their end paycheck. And um, it, you know, bottom line is, um, the more customers we have, the more money we're all going to make. Right, absolutely. Um, that's both 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 the things that you guys have just gone over are, are absolutely wonderful. Now I want to shift gears just a little bit here, because another point that just can cripple a collision shop is the what can be considered the out of control wastage <clears throat> of material going from department to department in the business <clears throat> and how that impacts the bottom line for an owner so greatly so let's just touch on that for a minute the the systems that you have in place for controlling material so that you don't have so much on hand that it's you know you're looking at all of your money just sitting on the shelves and it gets wasted because employees tend to look at things like well if it's an abundance it must well it's an abundance it's not valuable which I know is true I, I've watched that too many times you know it's uh, the old case of the can of brake clean there's open stock of it well you know hey I'll just go grab another one so how do you control your your materials so that you don't have wastage there or you minimize the wastage. There will always be wastage. Crickets. <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> you know, I, I look at, and I know Dino does too, look at our cost of paint and materials, which includes all our sandpaper, our tapes, our plastic, uh, includes all our um, 
seam sealers and urethanes and body fillers and putties. It, sandpapers, it includes everything. And I look at those uh, you know, on a weekly basis. And we're, we're currently putting together uh, a bonus plan, and, and I believe Dino already has one, for our technicians um, to, keep the, to keep the cost down mm -hmm. uh, and to keep them looking at it. So by, just by keeping statistics on it and showing them, um, we're going to put together like a quarterly, a quarterly bonus. If they can get it below a certain percentage, um, we're going to give them a percentage of the money that they save mm -hmm. based on kind of a baseline. Mm -hmm. So you know that'll keep keep everybody just looking at what they use and letting them, giving them some personal interest in keeping the cost down. Sure, they get uh, some skin in the game that way. Yeah. Well, let's let's just take a simple department like the detail department, which obviously has its own set of materials that it uses. So, how much stock do you keep on hand for the detailer? Is it against the number of jobs that are coming in for the week, or is it against last month's production? Is it against how much was used? How do you do that? You know, we have. Uh, um Right now, our detailer basically keeps enough enough stock so he doesn't run out. You know, uh -huh. it is it isn't very um, methodically done. Okay, so but he has a feel for it, and your manager has a feel for what is. Let's say we know on average we're doing ten cars a week, and ten cars take this much. Uh, uh, this much material, and yeah. so what it takes. I can eyeball that as a manager and go, okay, yeah, you need to reorder, or no, you don't need to reorder. You're fine, or what happened yeah. to this material? Right, and he needs to write a purchase order to to get any material, um, and we have standard products that we use, uh -huh. um, and those are all that he's allowed to reorder. He mm -hmm. does have to turn in a purchase order for him. Anything new or different, um, you know, he has to request mm -hmm. and have have a, uh, a good reason why we want to add something different. Okay, good. Do you know, are you doing anything uh, special we're, or different on we're, materials? We're doing a lot of things. Um, for one, they have a huge goal this year is to save a point which is about a $1,500 bonus for them, each of them, and they're only going to get 40% of that one point that we're going to save, get it, our cost of materials and um, supplies to 5% instead of 6% is where, you, you, where it usually runs. And we're at five and three quarters, so they already had a report. They're going to get a good bonus if they keep it up. Um, but the, the biggest thing that we do is um, our paint company, in each technician um, in the body shop has their own locker of material that they're accountable for. And every time they order material, it gets assigned to them, and I get a purchase order with their name on it so we can track how much money that technician is spending in material every month or every week. Um, and in the paint shop, every time they use material, and pull it out of the cabinet, they fill out a request, not a request form, it's actually a sheet of paper that they have next to the material so we can track what and how much they're using every day and every week. Because um, if there is a problem, we start to see an a influx of material going out the door, we know where it's going and you know we can point fingers pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, the detail cabinet is filled by the actual company itself and they have strict instructions, no more than one backup, and that way we always have material on, on stock. But everything else that's in our shop is um, it's consignment. We don't pay for it until we actually use it. So there's not a lot of material that we have out on the floor. Even with our paint, our liquid is consignment. Um, so all of our backup is someone else's money, not my money. Right. So th that way, making each employee uh, accountable yeah. puts a little more pressure on that aspect of the business, doesn't it? It does, and it is a. It can be waste 
material can be wasted, but that's when I decided to come up with a game because six percent is still pretty good. But uh, if I didn't give them something to shoot for, they wouldn't hold each other accountable. Like, hey, w what are you doing? Pick that up off the floor, you know? And that's what changes the whole mentality is I'm going to make a, a half a point more on my materials if we can get it to 5%. So what if I got to give up a half a point to get a, to get a, you know, to half a point? So for me, it's it was a perfect incentive for them to monitor themselves and mm -hmm. not waste material, especially with the painter repainting stuff. So he's like, well, shit, I better make sure this color's right to mm -hmm. cut down on that waste. Yeah, because I'd imagine paint by far is still the most expensive part of the process. Yeah, because the shop supplies is like 1.2%. Mm -hmm. So it's so little, um, it's hard to save a point there when you're only spending a percent and a half. Where the liquid, that's where your money's spent. Right. All right. Well, excellent. Those are uh, those are great ideas. Those are great tips, because uh, you know it comes down to if if you can control it, you will make more money. You'll have more on your bottom line. Uh, you'll actually have a happier shop. Everybody's head is in the game, and uh, the place stays uh, on top of it. And it's that control point. Control equals income. The the other thing I want to mention too, Cream mentioned it. Um, policy. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be written, and it has to be a policy that they they're going to agree to. Um, each of, one of my employees has their own manual, and we keep growing. The books keep growing when we come up with new ideas and better ways to handle stuff. But that's the the next step is to get the agreement with your employees to do the right thing, and then they understand what you're expected, and they do a better job. Absolutely. You know, policy, uh, I just did a, a wonderful podcast with uh, Steve Eck and PJ Roberts on policy, and, and they were saying virtually the same thing you're saying right now, and how policy is the glue that keeps the group together as long as everybody is in agreement, and good policy creates that agreement, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a, a little bit of uh, management magic right there. <laughs> All right. Hey, I want to thank you guys so much for your input. It's extremely valuable. Thanks for uh, spending your uh, time with me on this, and I hope folks who listen to this podcast uh, get some ideas, and especially on the training aspect, get your people trained. No doubt about that. That's so vitally important. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later, man. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.